Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be in the world, and thank you for joining us today. Um, we're going to be talking about confidential computing, uh, protecting data in use, uh, and this is a, a webcast by the SNEA Cloud Storage Technologies Group. Um, so jumping straight into it, uh, today's presenters, I'm joined by uh, Pavis Piravi and Paul O'Neill. Um, Pavis, do you want to just say hi quickly? Uh, absolutely, and, and thank you for having me here today, and thank the audience for joining the session. My name is Parviz Peravi. I'm Global CTO, Principal Engineer for Financial Services Industry Solutions at Intel. Perfect. Thanks, Parviz. And Paul? Hey, Glenn. Uh, great to be here, and looking forward to talking to everybody today. I'm part of the uh, confidential computing team here at Intel. Perfect, thank you. And I'm outnumbered by my Intel colleagues, so I'm Glenn Bowden, the CTO of the AI and data practice at HPE. But today we're all here with our SNEA hats on, so we're going to be talking about confidential computing. Um, so just to remind you, um, for those that don't know SNEA or the Storage Networking Industry Association, um, we're an organization that's full of uh, vendors and users as well uh, that look after education and technical standards, particularly around storage, but not only storage. Um, there's 180 industry leading organizations that are members at the moment. That includes two and a half thousand active contributing members and with over 50,000 IT end users and storage professionals worldwide relying on the organization. Um, you can, of course, learn more at sneer.org slash technical um, and you can find us on Twitter at sneer as well and there's a couple of other sub accounts if you want to go looking for them uh, that can give you some more information. Um, so in terms of what SNEA do, we, we focus on education. So that's uh, making sure that the vendors and the users that are using our uh, storage products, uh, including cloud storage, data services, and orchestration, know what's going on, keep up to date with relevant information and webcasts just like this one. Um, we support and promote business models and architectures, including things like OpenStack, software-defined storage, Kubernetes and containers, object storage, AI, machine learning, you name it, we, we, we have a, a point of view around it. Uh, and it's really about helping you understand things like hyperscaler requirements, incorporating them into our standards and programs as well. And more impo most importantly of all, and my favorite part of the organization, the ability to collaborate with the other industry leaders as well so, so we can build those standards that really make sense for the entire community. Um, there is a SNEA legal notice. I'm not a... Um, a lawyer of any kind, so um, basically it's all on you, I think is, is the summary of this. Um, it's we're mandatory to include it, so please do read it. Um, if you use any of our work, um, be sure to, to credit SNEA for it. It's, uh, it's uh, all listed in this text here. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to Paul to take you through the agenda. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Glenn. Appreciate that. Um, a uh, quick view of the agenda today, we'll, we'll talk about uh, lots of different things, but we're generally going to be keeping on the theme of confidential computing, uh, which is really a technology that uses hardware-based encryption to protect data in use. Uh, and this is the second in a series of these webinars. Uh, I think Lynn will point us to the first in this series. Uh, so if you do get a chance to watch that on demand, do, because it's fantastic with some great leaders in this space uh, talking amongst each other. Now, uh, we'll talk today a little bit about uh, trusted execution environments and why they're the bedrock of confidential computing. We, Parviz and I will give a, a market view of confidential computing and why this is kind of important. And then we'll go into some use cases and, and talk a little bit about what people are doing in the real world with confidential computing. Uh, Parviz will take us through a really interesting view of both the centralized uh, confidential computing use case and how this can be used in a federated uh, machine learning use case. And we'll give some key takeaways, et cetera, et cetera. But as I said, the focus is really about confidential computing. Now, as a background to this, um, you know, everybody I think on this call will agree that data is becoming ever more important for a modern economy. Uh, meanwhile, security uh, privacy expectations are increasing amongst companies regulators and consumers. Uh, so we've all heard of things like securing data at rest and in flight, but as organizations prepare to move their workloads to the cloud or allow their sensitive data sets to be acted on, one of the biggest challenges they face is how to process this sensitive data while still keeping it private. We think of HIPAA, GDPR, CCPA, and, and all the security breaches that we hear about on personal data on a regular basis, unfortunately. However, when data is being processed, there hasn't yet been an easy solution to keep it secure to date, as current technology is not really addressing these issues at any level of scale. Many enterprises are missing out on value creation from their data or gaining efficiencies from cloud economics. So very few companies are sharing data because once you've shared data, you've really lost control of it. Therefore, valuable data continues to be locked away in silos. 
However, confidence computing is going a long way to solving these problems. It's disruptive enabler of data protection and secure, secure computing, if you will. Now, I'll start the story on confidence computing at where we're, what we're doing at Intel and what we're doing at Intel to uh, provide a foundation for confidence computing. So as I, as I said in my outlier, uh, you know, I don't need to tell everybody here that security is important, but what's driving that need for security in the data center? As the world becomes more connected, we're seeing this exponential growth of data. So in order to process the data, new computing opportunities such as cloud or edge, analytics um, are emerging and transforming business operations. But those transformations can drive complexities for IT that could or can increase risks to business if security is not addressed properly. So we believe that this security must go hand in hand with this transformation. So a few trends are emerging in the security landscape. And in, here at Intel, we're sort of relentless in our pursuit of establishing what we call a trusted foundation. Encrypt everything, uh, throughout the life cycle from data generation through to retirement, keep workloads and data isolated, and build a chain of trust that's rooted in silicon. And all of these can help with compliance uh, with policies and regulations, which is one of the biggest challenges that a lot of our customers have uh, with their data sets. Now, um, security though is only as good really as the layer below it. Uh, you can have the most secure application in the world, but if the operating system is somehow compromised, it can spoof that application into thinking that it's okay. And as the security and the software layers improves, attackers are increasingly moving down the stack to look for new vulnerabilities. And that's why you need to start with security at the lowest layer possible, which is the silicon. Then you can build solutions on top of that trusted foundation. So at Intel, we're very much focused on protecting data throughout all of its phases but helping to protect the platform by establishing a chain of trust that's more resilient against compromise. And we're accelerating crypto functions to help ensure that you don't have to sacrifice performance to implement security. We don't see increased costs. We don't want to see increased costs for increased security. But today, uh, I want to drill into one of these in particular. Now, we've long understood it in, that data should be encrypted when it's being stored, and we've known that you should encrypt uh, data when it's being sent across the network. But what about when it's been actively processed in memory, especially today when systems are typically shared or even operated by a third party? Essentially, you're doing functions on someone else's computer. So protecting and creating confidentiality for data in use is this new frontier we're calling confidential computing. Now, why protect data in use? So application data and even the code itself uh, is under attack on a, on a very regular basis. Um, gone are the days when we can rely on perimeter defenses alone to keep us safe. Attackers these days can be hackers, uh, unauthorized third parties, or even malicious insiders that we kind of see on a very regular basis. And they can leverage exploits in other applications or privilege escalations in the operating system or hypervisor layers. And they can use these to access private data, expose proprietary code, or even manipulate the results of computation. So we need this multi-layered defense in depth strategy to make it cost prohibitive to execute successful attacks. Now, how do we do this uh, with, with confidential computing? Um, we're, we're powering confidential computing in what we call trusted execution environments. Um, now, I've, I've talked about our vision about securing uh, or building a secure foundation and protecting data in use, but how does hardware actually make that possible? For confidential computing, we're, we're talking about trusted execution environments, which are environments where the code executed and the data accessed is isolated and protected in terms of confidentiality. No one will have access to the data and integrity in the sense that no one can change the code and its behavior. A trusted execution environment is a secure area of a processor. It looks to guarantee protection for code and data inside the, the enclave itself with respect to confidentiality and integrity. It's a, it's, it provides um, a lot of uh, different types of, of uh, environments inside of the uh, enclave, like it, it helps increase protections for secrets, data, uh, in, in most cases it's data, keys or code, 
even when an attacker has full control of the platform. It helps prevent things like memory bus snooping or, or cold boot attacks, as it says here, uh, and protects uh, your secrets on a machine if that machine is somehow compromised. It also provides an option for hardware-based attestation, which is the capability to uh, allow increased transparency and accountability of what's happening for, to your data sets inside of those uh, hardware-based enclaves. There are a couple of uh, trusted execution environments available on the market today. Um, most of the ones I'll refer to later on today is what we call uh, here from Intel called Intel uh, Software Guard Extensions or Intel SGX. We'll see other uh, trusted execution environments from ARM's Trust Zone, but I'll likely refer to SGX for the rest of this talk as an example of a, of a trusted execution environment. Now, in summary, uh, trusted execution environments really deliver us a couple of three key sort of features, uh, certainly from an Intel perspective. And those three key features are execution isolation of the trusted execution environment boundary, which really means that uh, the data is unencrypted inside the CPU package, while data outside is encrypted and integrity checked. So external snoops can only see encrypted data. The second main thing that a trusted execution environment can provide is a hardware-based attestation. So this provides remote assurance that the right application is executing in the right platform, has the, the, the right version of software accessing my data sets, et cetera. And the third, a more tactical view of how can we recover from hardware issues? So how can we bring the trusted compute, compute base back and cryptographically demonstrate that the trusted compute base has been updated to fix potential security issues, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots of information uh, out there around trusted execution environments and a large set of, of hardware vendors and software vendors doing things like trusted execution environments. We have trusted execution environments, or T's as they're known, even on our smartphones today. So uh, quite ubiquitous uh, in, 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 the, in the world today. Now, again, it, it, just a wrap on why we need confidential computing uh, based on what I've just said there. Um, Higher value workloads require security guarantees around processing. Uh, we see this on a, on a daily basis. Personally identifiable information requires protection during computation. Government confidential information, again, requires protection during information. And higher value assets uh, as data becomes more critical um, to enterprises on a daily basis. So confidential computing based cloud paradigm is combating the paranoia of trusting cloud providers with your secrets. There's a few cloud providers today that are starting now to offer confidential computing. There's more than, than shown on these uh, slides here today. And I think you'll see confidential computing uh, really uh, on the rise over the next couple of years, where a lot of cloud providers are committed to providing uh, confidential computing solutions for not only uh, to allow people to access confidential computing areas in their cloud, with running services within confidential computing uh, paradigms like databases, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in order to frame uh, confidential computing properly uh, and make this a industry thing, the Confidential Computing Consortium was founded in 2019. Uh, and this is um, a consortium put together to bring hardware vendors, cloud providers, uh, software developers to accelerate the adoption of trusted execution environment technologies and standards. The Confidential Computing uh, Consortium is a project community at the Linux Foundation uh, dedicated to defining and accelerating the adoption of confidential computing. Uh, it'll embody open governance uh, and open collaboration um, that's aided the success of similarly uh, ambitious efforts, I, I, would, I would say. The effort includes commitments from uh, numerous member organizations and contributions from several open source projects. Confidential computing uh, protects data in use, as we said, by performing computation in hardware-based trusted execution environments, and it's very focused on that hardware uh, part of this uh, at this point in time. Um, the consortium will support an ecosystem of open technical projects, uh, open source and open standard specifications focused on confidential computing. Uh, and the consortium is concentrating in the area of data in use with the confidentiality of data in transit, and data at rest outside the scope of the consortium for now. So very much focused on data in use. The consortium intends to include participation from a fairly diverse group of members, uh, as I said, from semiconductor manufacturers like ourselves here at Intel, 
cloud infrastructure organizations, hardware vendors, software vendors, uh, and a lot of uh, ebullient ecosystem uh, members here, startups uh, operating in financial services space or healthcare space as well, joining the consortium on a regular basis. Um, we hope to see uh, lots of interesting new things coming out of the consortium over the next uh, you know, year or so, including uh, examination in areas like hardware-based attestation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so, so that's a sort of grounding on where we are with confidential computing, what it's based on, and here at Intel, how we're building trusted execution environments on top of our trusted foundation rooted down in the silicon. Uh, as a refresher, confidential computing uses that silicon-based trusted execution environments to be the foundation of its trust. So let's talk about what people are actually doing with confidential computing and, and sort of why it's important um, uh, for, for the industry outside. As I said in my intro, data is super important these days. Uh, lots uh, of corporations are embracing data. It's become more and more important for modern economy. Regulation, et cetera, uh, is increasing uh, amongst regulators, especially, uh, and, and also consumers. We see the world like um, two areas. We've got this uh, concept of lots of data sitting in silos, and by silo data, we can look at data like healthcare, or we can look at data like sensitive financial records, or even sensitive, um, you know, video processing from things like you know, autonomous vehicles or stuff like that. Anything that has personal uh, type of sensitive data or secret IP or whatever. But the challenge is that these highly regulated organizations want to move to secure private collaborative models for real-time insights. Uh, for, well, that's one of the areas that they want to look at. By incentivizing these sort of network contributions and leveraging the progress and pace of a wider network, these individual organizations can or will benefit from more compensated collaboration than competition. So trying to move data out of silos, whether it's in a federated model or through a cloud, uh, is really what, what what most enterprises are trying to do with data these days. Now, as we look at um, what the problem with data is and why they can't sort of do this right now, uh, I'll use a sort of topical example for this. So if you look at uh, what's happening in, in this sort of slide, we have two, the, the world is, is split into two. We have enterprises that are happy to share data, they trust service providers, they risk privacy and compliance, or maybe they have some you know, lengthy legal agreements in place with these uh service providers most of the world now when it comes to private data and sensitive data sets are not sharing data they're unable to get to uh, offer services or process or monetize that data in any way so we looked if we took an example here of imagining you're a hospital administrator and you're sitting on the, your desk and your your mouse is hovering over the submit button when you click that button, some of your patients' most sensitive healthcare records will be uploaded to a research firm which is performing a clinical trial. You have the patient's consent, and they desperately want to help advance medical science, but you're still worried. What would happen if a rogue employee at the research firm stole the data? What if the research firm is using your patient's data in a way that they didn't agree to? That's a pretty scary thought, and it's not just the hospitals, obviously, Parviz will talk later about how. Um, how this is a problem in financial services, but all organizations and all industries face this dilemma every single time they send sensitive data to a third party. The brutal uh, reality actually, is- Paul, uh, Actually, Paul, I think it's relevant. I, I mentioned that uh, short in, uh, in, in a short story here. Uh, I was working one of the, with one of the hedge funds uh, in uh, New York, very famous hedge fund. And one of the challenges they had in terms of data, uh, this was algorithm they developed for basically uh, the, their quant. Uh, so the problem they had that um, one of their developers, they stole the algorithm, sold it to uh, a foreign country um, um, and uh, for a million dollars. So what resulted is they started uh, looking into security uh, issues and how to prevent that. They end up using, this is about five, six years ago, uh, they end up actually gluing all of the USB ports. Uh, they they tried to put every possible measure to preventing people inside insiders, basically, hacker, uh, to, to take the code or to take the information out. So these are type of issues that we've been uh, facing and we continue facing 
uh, especially in trading environment, hedge fund environment, etc. Uh, that's going to uh, haunt us uh, going forward unless we deploy solution such as T that we mentioned in today to preventing some of this uh, basically uh, unauthorized access to the data, especially at the runtime. Right, right. And, and as you, as we said there, you know, as, as you send this data, you become uh you've given up all technological control over that data once it's left your computer and it's on somebody else so you're reliant on privacy policies goodwill contracts and law stuff that nobody reads uh, and that's the only thing protecting the most sensitive data but ultimately when you send data to somebody else's computer you've handed over full control to them they could change the algorithms as, as parvi said that are running and, and you would never know they could take a copy of your data and use it for their own purposes and you would never know they could give you false results and you would never know. Thinking about my incentivized collaboration, you just want to know whether it's the right stuff or not. Now, what if there was a way you could know, and what if you could know for sure what algorithm your service provider was running, and what if you could know if it had changed, and what if you could know that your data remains protected at all times so that the service provider could not observe uh, or copy it uh, in, in any sort of way. And that's what confidential computing provides a solution for. It allows us to imagine a new weapon in our privacy arsenal, right? The ability to protect your data or algorithms, uh, even whilst it's in the hands of somebody else. So in this simple case I gave in the previous slide, imagine if the hospital administrator could examine the algorithms that the research firm will use before they upload the data and that not even a rogue employee in the IT department of the research firm could see the patient data or change those algorithms. So confidential computing lets us imagine a future where you know for sure what will happen to your information after you click that upload button. And of course, this technology is not limited to doctors and hospitals as part of this, it's just given the example. Uh, we can uh, we see banks uh, sharing you know, data analytics and part of this will cover some of that uh, later. Groups of insurers can detect fraudulent claims by cross-checking against each other's private data sets, yet never revealing what the data actually is. So that's the future confidential computing techniques allow us to imagine. You know, coupled with other technologies that may be around the place like blockchains, you know, making powerful combinations that opens the doors to privacy preserving machine learning capabilities on private data sets, multi-party computation between untrusted, uh, untrusted parties on private uh, data sets, and the promise of federated learning, which we'll cover later as well. So moving on, um, as we look at who's using confidential computing, um, I think Parvi's, the, the first column is really one of the hot areas, right? Financial services. Absolutely. And, and really what we are talking about in here, uh, the, the, the known challenges in financial institution in general across this different segment, capital market, insurance, hedge funds, securities, um, uh, retail, et cetera, uh, is dealing with data. This is a well-known, it's going to be around for, for a long time. So one of the ways we are looking at to take advantage of confidential computing is enabling financial institution to have a secure environment, but not stopping at that. Uh, sharing information is uh, really desired between different financial institutions. In insurance uh, environment, sharing information about uh, uh, especially claims. Uh, for example, there are people that uh, uh, um, uh, apply for claim to multiple insurance companies, uh, tracking those and be able to share the information without sharing actual customer information. Uh, it, it's an analysis result that can be accessed, and I will talk about it a little bit more. That, uh, more In terms of money laundering, which is one of the number one challenge for financial institutions, uh, um, uh, and they've been fined um, in just uh, 2020, $3.25 billion across the world, uh, is that how do we deal with the issues? Even if the banks using the latest, greatest uh, AI technology, they have access to a slight, um, uh, just a slice of data. With that, you might not be able to detect uh, the money laundering pattern that will impact your bank. Asset digitization, um, and Paul talked about them, uh, using uh, blockchain technology. Now we are seeing blockchain technology with uh, confidential computing, with artificial intelligence combination, really bring solid value. Uh, and in an industry that they are uh, uh, really getting more and more excited about 
um, uh, collaboration on a non-competitive um, uh, topics, uh, confidential competing really gaining uh, traction. Uh, back to you, uh, Paul, on, on healthcare and emerging. Yeah, uh, thanks. Industry. Thanks for this. Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, healthcare obviously is another big vertical looking at confidential computing. And the reasons are really obvious for uh, what financial or what or Parviz explained around financial services. These are really the most legislated industries looking to adopt cloud economic models. These are the real drivers for these companies. But as we look at <clears throat> things like electronic health records, and we can look at company or countries like Germany who are launching uh, centralized digital records controlled by the government where you know insured uh, insurance records are all being centralized and and those insurance records can, can be aggregated or people have to start to have control over what happens to their digital records and in many ways they're bringing in laws in Germany where you can actually uh, donate your uh, digital records to uh, clinical research and, and, and areas like that. And that's bringing control of that data, not only back to the companies that generated, but the actual patient itself. And lots of interesting things around genomics and drug discovery. And as I said in my example, exchanging of data for clinical trials where a pharmaceutical A may have a data set that pharmaceutical B wants and trading that using a cryptographic intermediary like confidential computing rather than going through data obfuscation and anonymization and endless contracts and sampling of data, et cetera, et cetera. So it's speeding up, uh, you know, that whole sort of discovery area as well. And in many ways, this is not just about monetization of data. It's about operational efficiency through disintermediation as well. Um, lots of emerging areas uh, around confidential computing as well. You know, where there's data and where there's personal data uh, and where can we exchange data, retail loyalty, supply chain uh, with blockchain, et cetera, et cetera, where I'm most interested uh, really um, for the kind of next phase of what we do around confidential computing and our strategy is really, you know, how do we take confidential computing to the edge of the network and how can we bring data from edge to cloud using confidential computing techniques like uh, like hardware-based attestation where we can build provenance into data, we can watermark data, uh, et cetera. And lots of interest in industrial uh, sort of scenarios as we see the rise of machine as a service and people wanting to move to industry 4.0 how can we take sensitive data from machines that are not necessarily owned by a factory, aggregate them into models uh, and, and drive real-time insights? Now, as uh, corporations start to adopt um, you know, confidential computing, we've sort of hinted at some of these uh, use cases or usages for confidential computing. Uh, and they kind of boil down to these kind of six areas. You know, Obviously, the, 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 the one that I started with and the one that we've shown quite a bit of is this, how can I uh, have a confidential place in a cloud to put my stuff, right? How do I uh, protect confidentiality and integrity of my data in use in a multi-tenant of public cloud? Uh, and as I said, we see a lot of cloud providers now offering confidential computing. Um, and in many ways, that can be uh, an environment to do what you want in as part of a service uh, like uh, on Azure, for example, or it could be secure Kubernetes, or secure Docker containers, or it could be bare metal. And we see a lot of uh, a lot of each of those sort of scenarios. We talked about blockchain and how confidential computing and blockchain is really a match made in heaven. How do we keep private data and transactions secure for authorized network participants? How can we do attestation of oracles and taking smart contracts off the chain for execution um, and the results back on the chain? That's a, a really good use case for um, uh, confidential computing in sensitive supply chains, for example, uh, with blockchain. Um, uh, federated learning, and we'll go into that a little bit with, with Parviz. It gives a great example of how this plays out in a financial services um, scenario and privacy preserving machine learning. Now, privacy preserving machine learning is a very interesting area because if we look at, you know, here at Intel, we believe that over the next 10 years, the defining workloads are really going to be AI and ML. And if we look at things that are happening in this area like uh, machine learning on video from autonomous vehicles. If you look at some of the highly regulated countries here in Europe, where we take video from autonomous vehicles uh, and we train algorithms on that, we want to get those algorithms trained as fast as possible and as efficiently as possible, as cost-effective as possible. 
And by doing that uh, without using confidential computing, we're really getting into a scenario where data, uh, video would have to be obfuscated in some sort of way to be compliant. But keeping that video encrypted and doing that training inside of hardware-based enclaves uh, like Intel SGX means that there's no middle piece to obfuscate data and those machine learning algorithms get faster, quicker. Uh, and that really keeps everybody happy in those scenarios. Trust the multi-party computation, like the use case I, I, I talked about earlier, where medical companies can join data sets together and do multi-party computation on shared data, never seeing the data sets itself quite common in, in, in a lot of the legislated industries. And things like secure key management, um, you know, uh, trusted execution environments and confidential computing can provide a unified HSM and key management capability on a pretty scalable uh, and distributed architecture as well. Uh, Parvi, is there anything else to add to that? Did I miss anything? There? I think you covered most of the topics here, um, but, but some of the use cases could be combination of. Uh, of this uh, uh, basic use cases we are talking about. We, we said uh, blockchain, for example, with privacy preserving. Uh, there are POCs that we are looking into that. Um, uh, but, but in general, uh, the industry is really thirsty for a solution that enables them to take advantage of data, whether in data monetization in specific use cases or to uh, uh, basically utilize the data to provide uh, better accurate um, outcome from their specific uh, project, whether uh, direct data uh, uh, delivery or uh, through analytics and AI. So this is really what lead us to uh, next conversation about con uh, federated learning um, uh, architecture. And, and why do basically federated learning is keep popping up and getting more interest across industries. Uh, and um, if you take a look at financial services, it's very well known that uh, each banks have their own data. Uh, even banks within uh, one institution, they are from data services is fragmented across different business unit, different island within the banks itself. So it's really a significant challenge for risk management, uh, whether risk and compliance or just risk management in financial services in capital market and et cetera, uh, to get data easily to do analysis. Uh, so. And when you uh, extend that to between the different banks, there is no sharing due to compliance and regulation that existed uh, um, uh, at the moment. Many things that can be done much faster, better, more accurate, and, and greater customer experience is really present, uh, prevented. So that's why there is an appetite for financial institution to, to, to collaborate and share information, not raw data, uh, not, uh, not PII data, but information that is going to help them uh, to achieve certain um, incentivized basic collaborations, uh, such as fraud detection, such as money laundering, financial crime in general. Uh, so the, and cybersecurity, which is now it's uh, at the top of the list of every CISOs that I've been talking to. Uh, today, their view is very limited to own data set. And, and ability to go beyond that and be able to provide a solid information with a lot more details. Uh, it's really reliant to getting more data from different geographical location, from different banks that they do deal with different type of uh, clients and et cetera, really enrich the data processing. And this is where we tried it. Actually, we did a, a, a proof of concept with UOB uh, bank in, in uh, Singapore and a regulator, MAS, Monetary Authority of the Singapore in 2018, and we showcased it and talked about it. Uh, we look at this issue, we actually were able to create a centralized approach that when we brought data from multiple banks in one locations and we were able to run um, a federated query on top of that. The, the POC was successful. However, the challenge was if we were going to expand that beyond one country, uh, we, uh, we faced with uh, prior, uh, basically privacy and data sovereignty specifically. Uh, and on top of that, we deal with data gravity. The volume of data is significant to move it around, and the data sovereignty basically prevent us to do that. And that's the reason federated learning um, uh, was a actually much better choice. 
So what this architecture is about is we centralize the model development in this approach. You can have a distributed model development as well. But in this approach that we are doing right now, we are doing a proof of concept. Uh, we centralize the model development. What that means is based on synthetic data or sample of data, we create an initial model. Uh, and uh, in this case, we are talking about the algorithm factory uh, that developing this model. And uh, uh, we basically sign a contract with multiple banks on uh, developing this federated network. This is a trusted network. Um, um, but even with trusted network, you have to ensure you have a trusted computing infrastructure in place that we can communicate with each other. So that's the first level of trust environment. The second was, well, we developed the algorithm uh, and we want to send the algorithm to all banks at the same time or one at a time. There are different methods we can use, round robin method or full distributed method to do that. Uh, let's say in the round robin method, we send the algorithm to bank one, then bank two and bank three. Uh, every time we send the algorithm to each bank, we are getting back only weights and hyperparameters. There is no PII data com communicated. There is no direct touch to the data at the bank. We get those. And when we combine uh, multiple banks weight and basically hyperparameter, we recalculate the average. And then we basically update the model and we send that back again to all of the banks. So we do continuously this method, so it's a continuous training. What, what it does is keep us with the latest data that has been basically um, each bank's collecting and, and, and enable to enhance in the algorithm continuously. We provide the inference model to each banks when we reach a certain uh, basically um, agreement and, and level of accuracy or quality. Uh, which, by the way, is not all automated because we, uh, due to AI explainability, responsible AI and AI ethics, we have a committee human being actually review the process, review the model, and then we send that out as an inference model to all banks. So now they can benefit from collective knowledge gained from uh, uh, basically working with different banks. In this, and in this method, we do need to be able to secure the communication between Algo Factory to each of the banks, uh, back and forth for communications. We also need to ensure that algorithm that we develop in Algo Factory is secure. That's why we are using T uh, slash SGX. Uh, so we secure the model in the runtime environment and development environment. When we send it to each banks, we also secure it in a T environment and, and secure enclave on each of the banks. So we secure data in the runtime. So we also use attestation. So we attest before we send information to each bank or open the communication. So we know who we are communicating with. We have a track record of all these activities. So we can provide that as a reporting to auditors. So they are being able to detect any deviation if there is any as a result of activities and, and joint development that we are doing. So this model solved the problem of data sovereignty. We don't move data, uh, stays, uh, stays within different countries, different uh, companies. We solve the problem of data privacy because we are not using PII data and we are in um, using um, both on development and the runtime environment uh, for each bank's in, in inference model as well. Um, all of them is protected by trusted execution environment. So fully trusted platform, trusted computing and infrastructure platform at, at the edge and at, at the Algo factory. Uh, and then uh, on, on top of that, again, we are applying the SSL TLS for communication for security and, uh, and if required data address, uh, that will be also implemented. So we are using taking advantage of all security methods to provide the ultimate security for a distributed uh, uh, basically uh, computations and, and collaboration environment with federated land. Back to you, Paul. Yeah, uh, brilliantly explained, uh, Parviz. I, I actually had one question back for you. You mentioned uh, the word compliance there in attestation. Can you, can you talk for two more minutes on the compliance here and potentially how confidential computing can lead into compliance using techniques like attestation? Uh, 
Absolutely. So one of the core compliance, especially when it comes to data and model, uh, is ability to track what was an activity or type of um, uh, uh, basically uh, event that happened at any given time. Uh, if we develop a model that the result of that model um, uh, turns out to be a inaccurate and cause a uh, um, basically problem for people, um, people lives or any other financial systems issues, auditor want to know at what time and how this happened. So that mean goes back to understanding the data sources, where the data has been, how the model has been developed. Uh, and, and be able to track all of those activities. So data lineage has been around forever, and now we are extending that on model lineage, data lineage, and overall governance. So therefore, auditors and regulators can actually examine the whole data flow and model development and execution. If there is anomalies, then there we can explain that to the auditor. And that's why I mentioned that confidential computing, it's a foundation that enable you to build on top of it, AI explainability with a solid proof of data and model lineage combination together. And allow that uh, banks actually expand the usage of AI uh, because now they can actually comply with regulators uh, requirement. Awesome. Uh, it's super important. Now, as Parviz has eloquently uh, explained federal learning here in a financial services case, you can imagine also how you would apply this to a, a medical scenario. The same principles apply in some of the medical scenarios that we may see in these data islands. We have huge data sets. Uh, you know, maybe these data sets just can't be moved. It's not just the, the, the privacy part of it. They're just too big. And in a lot of these cases, we actually don't know whether there's any real value in, in any of these data sets as well. So best to push uh, out there. And also in a medical scenario, you know, you've got lots of different types of records and different agreements for each one. And, you know, the portability of health data is, is problematic with privacy regulations changing with each jurisdiction, et cetera, et cetera. So an incredibly challenging environment, right? Inhibiting incentivized network collaboration. And I think uh, this concept of federated learning is really here to say we, we are very, very excited about it. Of course, the centralized model is still uh, the most prevalent one right now. We see people collaborating in the public cloud using uh, cryptography like SGX uh, as, a, as an intermediary. And by the way, Paul, um, you can implement this algorithm factory in a distributed fashion uh, or in a centralized fashion, as well as in the cloud, on-prem or combination. So there is uh, there is no necess necessary restriction because, again, uh, T with um, uh, trusted computing environment with federated learning uh, provide that ability. Uh, on top of that, I want to mention that we have developed uh, federated learning software open source that available, so is other industry partners. I highly recommend folks to take a look at those and, and if they, they want to get their hands dirty, the software is available on GitHub. Of course, and if you're an independent software vendor, federated learning is incredibly important for you because you really are sending your algorithm, your secret sauce, your IP, your company valuation out into unprotected areas. So that model needs to be protected, your IP needs to be protected. Okay, uh, very good. So it, just to wrap then on you know, privacy and security in, in, in federated learning, there are two sort of areas that uh, it's super important. This whole concept of confidentiality helps protect that model IP. It, it's also designed to protect uh, attack computation uh, inside of uh, the, the, the training itself. Data is not moved, uh, promoting privacy or respecting uh, local privacy laws. Uh, and remember, we've done federated models across 11 different countries. So imagine the challenge of that. So compliance with local laws is, is always observed. And what's a really important part of confidential computing is this thing on the right, integrity and attestation. So only approved models and training procedures are allowed inside of the Federation and confidence computing will enforce that. Uh, so all the participants know and can trust that the rules are enforced inside of the uh, Federation and algorithmic defenses help prevent bypass. So 
we built it and designed it to stop attackers from using the model or designed it to stop attackers from being adaptive. So that's the concept and the promise of confidential computing uh, with federated learning. Okay, now, so we've talked a lot about, you know, uh, what Intel's doing in the data center, how we're building this trusted foundation, how we were, we're building uh, thing concepts like our technologies like SGX, and how the Confidential Computing Consortium is building on top of that trusted foundation with uh, Intel SGX. And we've shown some good examples of why uh, this is important, and Parviz has shown us how it's actually working in the real world. But the question that a lot of people are going is, okay, how do I do this, right? How do I how do I become uh, a confidential computing developer, or how do I take advantage of confidential computing? There is work to do. This is not just take it out of the box, unwrap it, and, and away you go. There are two ways to work with trusted execution environments, and again, I'm going to use Intel SGX as the sort of main driver for for this next piece. We can do two things. We can take uh, an SDK and we can uh, you know, build code for new application, that means that the trusted portion of your application will utilize the enclave for code and data. And that means you go into a, a hardware-based enclave when you need to within your application. And there's a couple of SDKs that are out there. Now, all of these SDKs, uh, not sorry, not all of these SDKs, some of these SDKs will be governed under the Confidential Computing Consortium and will become part of the Confidential Computing Consortium. For example, the Open Enclave SDK, uh, which was originally promoted by Microsoft. The SGX SDK is an Intel SDK. So these SDKs are here to use uh, for new application development and the most secure, where you have the most control over your application. I referenced earlier on, for example, digital healthcare records uh, in private data centers uh, in Germany, uh, I think was the example I used. They would be using an SDK uh, for those because they want the most control and they only want to use, uh, they only want to access the sensitive data sets at a certain part of the application. What's very common and what's becoming more and more common uh, and favorable is what's on the right hand side is the whole concept of lift and shift, as we call it. Lift and shift really means taking what you have and securing it using a trusted execution environment. And that needs a layer of it, or even something like a library OS, like Graphene here. Now, the reason that this is popular is because a lot of companies are now adopting confidential computing and they don't want to refactor code. Uh, they want to take existing code and move it into enclaves or move it to the public cloud in a confidential way and secure it that way. Uh, and, you know, a lot of, uh, we, we've mentioned medical uh, companies here a lot. We've talked about financial services companies a lot. They are companies who do not want to sit down and refactor code. So uh, library OSs like Graphene, which is uh, which will move into the Confidential Computing Consortium in the next month or two, I think, uh, which is uh, a lot of Intel uh, resources behind it, is uh, a way to take uh, containers and secure containers using um, using Graphene. So Kubernetes or Docker uh, moving in that way. Graphene will also build things like, or has the ability to give you recipes to run modern um, uh, training workloads using Redis or TensorFlow or, or whatever inside of Graphene security in that way. And then you see a lot of these, uh, a lot of companies who are ecosystem partners of ours, we've called out uh, a couple here, uh, who are also building applications in this area, or three, Fortanix, uh, Scontain, and Edgeless Systems. Uh, they are companies spread across uh, uh, Europe and the USA. And there's more as well uh, from an ecosystem perspective. It's quite a brilliant. Uh, so a lot of people in uh, in this sort of area of lift and shift as well. So that is the fastest way to, to do uh, confidential computing uh, using that term lift and shift. So I think um, as a sort of key takeaway to, to sort of wrap this up, um, you know, uh, when we look at confidential computing uh, and what's happening uh, in that whole area, we built this whole concept on security being foundational to this business transformation that I uh, that I started about at the end. Trusted execution environments are are, are built into hardware. Um, they are the the founding and trusted layer of, as part of this whole confidential computing paradigm shift. Confidential computing is powered by trusted execution environments and becomes fundamental to securing the most sensitive data sets in use. 
uh, where privacy, uh, confidentiality, and integrity is required. Um, there are multiple choices in deploying trusted execution environment-based solutions, uh, different levels of security offered by uh, hardware, software, and, and cloud service providers out there. But confidential computing uh, over the next year or two will bring more and more uh, into that capability and more and more to offer uh, as confidential computing becomes ubiquitous. Ultimately, we'd like confidential computing to get to a point where DevOps, you know, secure uh, data records based on, you know, how important the sensitive record and not have to worry about what technology is behind it or what cloud service uh, providers behind it. Um, Parviz, any closing thoughts from you? So what I uh, really want to mention in here is uh, confidential computing is going to be here and, and stay here uh, because of due to um, uh, Paul, if you can put on uh, mute. Um, uh, so uh, it's going to stay here, especially in financial services that I've seen. And, and frankly, I've been working very closely with health healthcare industry as well, trying to um, uh, take the learning from healthcare and combine it with financial services to even have a better um, uh, development process. Uh, what, where we are seeing that confidential competition, uh, confidential competition is going to increase is uh, as companies start classifying their data uh, and understanding what data, what level of security uh, requirement based on regulation that they are facing, we will see the confidential competition is going to come on top because allow them to have an umbrella approach while they can tier uh, their data security, their um, application code security, uh, and different aspect of the flow. Uh, and what we are seeing uh, with um, uh, different use cases we talked about, uh, as adoption of AI is increasing, as adoption of blockchain technology is increasing, you will see more of a confidential computing requirement uh, and the need uh, uh, increases in the market. So I highly recommend uh, uh, folks that listen into this session, uh, is that take a look at information is available. Uh, and there is a lot of information from a SNEA that we talked about previous session and this one and the next session about this uh, and outside in, in an industry that talking about use cases such as federated learning uh, and, and increase the uses of uh, new type of implementation, especially at the edge. Um, uh, this will, this technology is gonna really help us uh, to deal with a lot of this uh, issues of uh, privacies and securities and regulations. Uh, and by that, Paul, I think um, uh, my last uh, comment is we are all here to help. Uh, all technology vendors are working in these areas. Uh, and I, I hope we, in collaboration with, with you, uh, that we can develop even more comprehensive and easy to use confidential computing uh, infrastructure technologies. Fantastic. Uh, back to you, Glenn. Thanks, Paul, and, and thanks both of you for, for what's uh, an excellent and very educational presentation. Um, as we mentioned, this is uh, part two of a th three-part series. So um, what you're looking at on the screen at the moment is where you can find part one to this. Um, I thoroughly recommend checking that out. Um, it's a discussion on the basics of uh, confidential computing and, and obviously why you should care about it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then obviously there's there's part three coming in July. So not long to wait until part three. If you follow us on Twitter at Snea Cloud, um, you'll get the date and time uh, as soon as it gets announced. So be sure to, to sign up for that one um, once you've watched these first two. So all that remains for me is um, thank you all for viewing this webcast. Um, what I will request, uh, one little favor, is if you could rate the webcast and also give us some feedback. So not just give us the score, but if you can spend the time to give us a little bit of feedback as well, that would be really appreciated. What this does is make sure that we can target the content of the things you're looking to get. Um, we make sure we're, we're talking at the right levels, we're covering the right content, um, and we, we know we're hitting the right mark. So please give us that feedback um, when you leave us that review. Um, a webcast and a copy of the slides are available at the SNEA Educational Library. The link is there. We also have an attachments feature here. So the slides are actually attached to this presentation now. So if you look at the attachments, you should be able to go and grab a copy of them today. Um, we will post a Q&A for this webcast. We've not had so many questions because it was so well covered. If you do have any questions, then you can reach out to us at any of our Twitter accounts or emails or, or 
get through to us on any of the usual channels. Ask some questions as well. Um, once you've reviewed this, uh, if you go back again and, and have other questions or link it with the first one, um, feel free to reach out to us with those questions. We will be posting a blog um, in the coming weeks that will cover any Q&A that comes up from this, um, either the folks that are here live today or folks that have watched those as a recording. Um, and once again, go and follow us on Twitter. You'll get uh, more information about more talks like this. So thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we hope you've enjoyed the webcast. I've certainly enjoyed listening to it from, from my end. Um, thank you all and have a great day. Thank you.